on today's Monday News Pod. You think it's the 2024 Padres? No, 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 no. It's still the 2023 Padres blowing it in fantastic fashion, losing two out of three games to the San Francisco Giants. Going to be talking about what went right, very little, and what went wrong, a whole lot. A whole lot of rants and answering some of your questions. Let's get on into it. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Monday, April 8th. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You might be familiar with my work over at Just Baseball, where I write about not just the Padres, but about general baseball stuff. It won't help that my last article was about how Jung Ho Lee might be the Jalen Brunson of Major League Baseball. What can I say? I like being experimental with my writing. So you can go check that out. You can also check out my podcast, Baseball vs. the World, for more fun stuff on baseball, culture, topics. A lot of fun. Go check that out Um, in my bio on Twitter, at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Of course, though, go check out the YouTube. Go check it. It's free on all platforms. Your first listen every day. You know the drill at this point. Um, But let me tell you, speaking of knowing the drill, folks, you probably know the drill when it comes to being a Padres fan. Uh, these days because this weekend series was pure Padresing, including the game they won, frankly, including the game they won. And we're going to recap all of that as well as get into some of your questions. Although admittedly, you guys were slacking a little bit this week. Not too many questions, but still, it doesn't matter. We're still going to go over them. But remember, of course, every Monday we do question stuff. So send them to me at Javapeno or YouTube comments or at LO underscore Padres or whatever. Today's episode, guys, is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown MLB and use code all lowercase lockdown MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Where do we even start? Well, we're going to start, of course, with the last game that was played, in which the Padres sent me down a little bit of a spiral. Um, and what I mean by that is by the time you are watching this, I haven't done it yet because I'm recording a podcast, but I will be watching comfort food type of movies. Am I putting on a rom-com? Maybe. Am I putting on When Harry Met Sally? Am I watching some of my old favorite anime or something like that? Maybe. There was something about this weekend. And don't get me wrong, this has been a, a weird start for the Padres. They had the first series against the Giants that was weird. They didn't. They played really badly against the Cardinals for sure, but there was something about this one, and the reason is because it is a division rival, and it is a division rival last year that people people might forget. The Giants last year were not very good. Um, they actually they started off pretty strong. They were they were okay. Their offense was okay. Lamont Wade Jr. was like a, a bargain bin Juan Soto in a lot of ways at the beginning of the year, and they had the infamous like bullpen blowups. Even when the bullpen looked like it was okay at times, they got walked off two nights in a row. That's why I think that this reminded me especially of the 2023 Padres. The loser energy on this team continues to be uncanny. And it is way too early. The Padres are still just 5-7. and seven. Like, it's not the end of the world. There are other teams that aren't getting nearly as much flack. Like, the D-backs don't have a great record. There's there's plenty of them. And the who is it that's like 7-1? and one? Like, the Tigers are 7-1. and one. The Guardians, who I think have only two good hitters, I think they have a good record. Like... It's not over. Don't get me wrong. Actually, shout out to Rama Murdy who reached out to me at DM and said, is this a rebuilding year? No, not not just yet. But when it comes to this game, we're going to talk about Sunday first. Um, let me just bring up the numbers really quickly. The Padres lose this one two to three. Or Hold on. Is that how you say it? Three to two? Yeah, they lose it three to two. Uh, the same, both scores that they lose this weekend, three to two, a one run game. Sound familiar from 2023? My Lord. Uh, but in this game, what's even more frustrating is you got a decent start out of Matt Waldron. This is your five starter, and he didn't look incredible, but big thing, only walked one batter. He goes five and a third. I think that they pushed him a little bit where it was like, should you have kept him in? For that sixth inning, I don't know. I know you're trying to keep the bullpen healthy and whatnot. Thankfully, Kulik and Matsui do hold down the fort. But in this game, I mean, the Padres are just, they just hit into multiple double plays. You have the Jake Cronenworth double in the first inning that allows Tatis to score, which is great. And then you get a Hassan Kim single, which allows Jake Cronenworth to score. Jake Cronenworth cannot be emphasized enough. I really think this guy's back. 
He's hitting 300 right now, or 286 right now, actually. Yes, he hasn't hit a home run yet, but he is smacking the crap out of the ball. He got robbed, and as I mentioned before, in the Cardinals series with the game, kind of like the game-ending double play. It wasn't literally the end of the game, but the double play ball, he got unlucky. He got unlucky with some you know, really hard-hit balls. Like He's been hitting well, and he's been getting unlucky. I really have just been so impressed with him. I think he's smoking the ball, and I love that he's bouncing back in that three-hole, which was a big question for him. In this game, two for four with a double and an RBI. Does strike out twice, but even still, this is not on him. Um, it's just, ugh, what happens in this game? Okay. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so they bring in the, the relievers, and they're able to hold down the fort pretty well, I think, all things considered. Um, in the bottom of the six, Matt Chapman hits into a fielder's choice um, that gets what's his face. Jung Ho Lee is able to score. The Giants, of course, win this game in the bottom of the eighth in classic Padres fashion. They blow the game in the bottom of the eighth after, for some reason, Johnny Brito is brought into this game. Um, here's the thing I don't hate Johnny Brito. I just think that for some young kid who's kind of unproven, I think it's really weird how often he's been in high leverage situations this year. And I was looking at the bullpen a little bit. You could have used probably Wandy Peralta. Like, he went on Friday, but I just think you could probably try that guy instead. Like, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe they had some faith in him. But it reminds me very similarly of Luis Garcia last year. Again, this there was so many 2023 vibes with this weekend series. Luis Garcia, where you're just hoping that he kind of figures it out. And at some point, he can't keep giving up runs, right? And it never happens. So, Brito, I just think that this is not the spot for him. That being said... That being said, it is a moot point if the Padres do not do what they always do, which is continue to find new ways to lose. For those who remember when the Chargers were in San Diego, it was the same thing. It is San Diego sports in a nutshell, apparently, is that you find different ways to lose no matter what the talent is, no matter what the situation is, they just blow it. And that's what they do here with a game-saving, dare I say, double play ball that Jay Cronenworth snags and he taps first base and then throws it to Hassan Kim, who then loses the ball. After the runner runs into him, it goes into the outfield, and then guess what happens? They end up scoring. And then, of course, to add insult to injury, why not? Let's give the Padres one more chance. In the bottom of the ninth, or I should say top of the ninth, um, Graham Pauly, he pinch hits for Zokar. He strikes out. Good job, Padres. You know the guy that's really good against hitting righties and lefties? No, no, no. We're going to make sure that Tyler Wade starts every game. Not a high upside player. In fairness, he's not playing that bad, but I'm just saying. Instead, we are only going to give Graham Pauly opportunities when it's like every seventh day or bottom of the ninth in pinch hitting situations. That's the same BS that they pulled with Luis Campizano. I don't know why they keep doing this, and it's driving me insane. They did that with Luis Campizano. They sent him down to the minor leagues, and then you bring him up, and it's like, oh, no, Austin Nola's too good. We got to start him. Tyler Wade's too good. We got to start him instead. Figure out what you're doing with these young guys. Do you want to use them or do you not want to use them? Do you want to keep using journeyman players that haven't ever shown, in the case of Tyler Wade, that they're an above-average offensive player? Literally. Go ahead. But Grand Pauly strikes out. Then you get a strikeout from Tyler Wade because, of course. And then Jackson Merrill gets a single in this one. Jackson Merrill had a great game. By the way, he's one of the great. There are positives. I just mentioned Cronenworth. We've got the pitching to talk about. Matt Waldron had a decent game. Didn't get a lot of whiffs and whatnot on his curveball or his knuckle. But I will say that his movement was pretty good. So you get all that, and you get a Jackson Merrill four-hit game. He goes four for four with four singles, and also, because why not, gets a stolen base. In this game, bottom of the ninth, he had no fear. I love to see that from a rookie. And he steals second base. Then, makes sense, you pinch hit Luis Campizano for Kyle Higashioka, and I want you to guess what happens. He strikes out. I love Luis Campizano. I've been a, one of the chief architects of the Hive, as I've mentioned before. It does... I'm going to bring up very quickly that Luis Campizano's statistics career-wise in high leverage situations are garbage. Now, don't get me wrong. As I mentioned, he was being used in a way that I did not like at the very beginning of his Padres tenure, 2020, a little bit in 2021. I didn't like that. But even still, in his career, in low leverage situations, he has a 107 WRC+. Plus. Medium leverage, 128. And in high leverage, a 52 WRC+. Plus. What is with every player on this stupid team that turns into a pumpkin? Every single time it matters these past two years. Now, with Luis Campizano, the reason I don't bring it up is twofold, right? There's two reasons. One, it doesn't help my hive agenda, frankly, whenever I bring this up. That's why I've been hiding it. And number two, because everyone on this godforsaken team is horrible in high leverage situations, with the exception a little bit of Hassan Kim last year and then a tiny bit with Tatis last year as well. 
Grisham was terrible. Cronenworth was terrible, then got hurt. Machado, you're up by six, no problem. Solo shots galore, you get the gorgeous swing. We're down by three, and we have runners on first and second, double play every time. Xander Bogarts, same thing. He turns into Tyler Wade's whole career whenever the runners are on base. I am, it is so early, don't get me wrong, but it is incredible, incredible. With this talent, I know that there are other teams that struggle with runners in scoring position. They don't have guys that are getting paid for 11 years with big time money. I'm not saying money means that like it's like a bad thing necessarily. It's just that they're clearly supposed to be the big guys on the team. At least with Bogarts, you could be like, you know what? I'll save that for the next segment. But I just, it's so frustrating that they find a new way to lose. I don't know why you're bringing in Jody Brito like that. And then of course, you find a new way to lose. It's what the Padres do. It's what they've been doing for a year and a half now. I don't understand it. It's one of those things that supersedes statistics and who's on your roster. Everyone who keeps telling you that the Padres don't have depth, that's not true. They have depth. And even if that wasn't true, the people that are at the top of this, this lineup should be producing more to make up for that. That is why they were bad last year, right? And not to mention, not to mention, why are we acting like every other team, their six, seven, eight, and nine hitters are amazing, right? That's just not true. It's just not true unless you're Atlanta or you're LA, right? The Padres have the depth. That is not a problem, especially this year, because you're getting Merrill stuff. You're getting stuff from Jake Cronenworth again. You have stuff. This is great. Luis Campuzano is already better than Austin Nola has ever been for the Padres, right? Even Jerickson Profar. Even Jerickson Profar has something. But they're still the Padres. They're still the Padres, ladies and gentlemen. I will continue my ranting in just a moment with a little bit of positivity. Don't worry. I hope you're enjoying this because I am certainly not enjoying um, once again, being treated to the same BS from the same Padres team. But let me tell you one thing I am enjoying, ladies and gentlemen. That is the good folks over at Prize Picks, the number one fantasy sports app in good old America. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, three million members. I'm sorry. Oh, my bad. Three million plus members over on Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you're watching your favorite sports and players. All you have to do is just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll right in. Ladies and gentlemen, that's his right. And also, also, check this out. I mean, we got baseball every day. Don't get me wrong, we got stuff. But basketball's postseason's coming around, folks. That's right. Playoffs begin April 20th, and the play-in rounds are April 16th, 17th, and 19th. So keep that in mind if you want to get in all of this action. They have something for everybody. Like, you know, they've even got community tabs that you can go into with, like, you know, more famous people like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley. You can check out that stuff as well. They have injury insurance. Like, if your players get injured, like, in the middle of the game, don't worry. Like, that, that happens. They help you out there as well. And also check this out, like for baseball games, for example, if you have a player who registers two plate appearances or less, prize picks will have your back and not count that as a loss. So there you go. Say some player gets hurt, it's okay. You're all, you're all good on that. So don't worry about that because for all my fantasy folks out there, you know, fantasy football managers, you know how rough it is when like you lose your first round pick for the year. Well, don't worry. They got you covered here. Download the app and use code LOCKDOWNMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Remember this promo code LOCKDOWNMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with price picks. Mm-mm-mm. And just like that, folks, we're back here on the Lockdown Padres Rage Podcast. Let's keep talking, folks. I was mentioning with Xander Bogarts and Manny Machado, I think those two haven't had a clutch hit in 18 months now. Um, so I want to congratulate them for that. It must be really hard to literally ever get a hit when runners are on base and when games matter. Um, it, it's just... I tweeted this, I think, on Friday, where it's it just doesn't make sense that you have a top of a lineup with Tatis, Bogarts, Machado. And then if you consider that Cronenworth is stepping up right now, and then maybe Hassan Kim, who's having a bad season so far, especially with this error and whatnot, it's incredible how not scary they are. Every time. I'm talking first pitch outs. Ground ball right to the third baseman. Thank you. You are literally the batter that we fear the most. Out in one pitch, you are literally making it easier for our pitching staff. They have no situational hitting whatsoever. And so far, that might not be a manager thing. Because we have a new one in Mike Schilt. So, I'm just saying. Um, Tatis, by the way, uh, 1 for 4 in this game. Bogart's 0 for 4. Because why not? Um... Let me just quickly talk about Saturday's game. It's the one game that they win. But in this one game, it is still 2023 Padres. You know why? Because Michael King, great start. Um, there's actually a point that someone's going to make on him uh, in the listener mail section that I want to bring up. But Michael King, a lot better in this start. The velocity was down again, which I did not like. 
um, whatsoever. That was that was not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? I did not. I was not a fan of that. But um, he looked sharp, uh, like really, really sharp. A lot of his he didn't walk anybody nearly as much as the previous game. Right? Only one walk, only four strikeouts. And again, like I said, his velocity was down. But he did get a lot of swings and misses on his changeup. Changeup looked crazy. There was like some real like pitching ninja esque moments. The way that his pitches were dipping, where it was like a sight to behold. So, Michael King, really nice bounce back start for him. I did say, I believe on Friday's episode, that if there was one thing for Padres fans to watch this weekend, it was Michael King's start, and he came through. And also, more importantly than the the the, the strikeouts and the changeups and all that stuff for me, seven innings, love that always for my starter, especially in today's game. Um, but the reason why I'm saying this was still a 2023 Padres type of game, they're only offense comes from a Jerickson profile grand slam in literally the top of the first inning and nothing happens for the rest of the game nothing now don't get me wrong Jake Cronenworth does get a little bit or no I'm sorry not Jake Cronenworth um Cronenworth has been robbed a few times this season but this is um Jackson Merrill does get robbed in this game by Jung Ho Lee uh for a, 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 a ball that had an 800 expected batting average so very unlucky there um, don't get me wrong. Even Luis Campizano, he smoked the ball a little bit, got a little bit unlucky. Jerkson Profar had a ground out that he got a little bit unlucky with, but you know, decent stuff all around, but it's just so Padres that like they have this dynamite start and they only got their offense in one inning. And that was it. Refusing to get any more. They said, this is it. And if the bullpen gave up any runs, God forbid, you know that they were going to lose that game. So that was really frustrating, but, uh, nice to see it. Nice to see the Jerkson Profar grand slam. I don't know why he's just indescribably better. I don't know why he becomes the Kwisatch Haderach whenever he's with the Padres and only with the Padres, but Profar deserves a lot of credit. He's performing. Profar, Campuzano, Wade, Jackson Merrill, and Cronenworth are all performing. Like, Cronenworth's probably performing above expectations, and then same thing for the rest of them. And their expectations are, we don't know. They're not you're supposed to be the stars of the team, especially someone like Jackson Merrill, who's a rookie. And I think he's been hitting the, the snot out of the ball at points and even drew a walk in this game, which I appreciated. So that's really great. That's really great. Um, love that. Don't get me wrong. But the stars of this lineup, man, the terrible trio, dare I say, is one of the problems with this team. And that's Hassan Kim, Manny Machado, and Xander Bogarts. Xander Bogarts, I got some comments like, hey, man, at least he gets a bloop single. And I'm like, agreed, but I don't like it when my hitter's only thing that they're getting is something that's a lot more reflective of Babbitt luck versus, like, really good hitting. And don't get me wrong, Xander Bogarts is a player that has never, not never, but he hasn't really been, like, a hard hit guy, even in some of his best seasons. He's just a hitter. And that's why, like, stat cast profiles don't tell you everything because Luis Arise barely hits the ball that hard, but he's, you know, a hitter, right? Like, he's he's like the modern-day Tony Gwynn for a, a Padres comparison, right? And so far this year, his hard hit rate has managed to go down. What I do like is he isn't chasing anything, but it's almost like he, he just looks weak up there. He looks meek, dare I say, when he's swinging the ball. Don't get me wrong, it's nice that he's expecting batting average is high. His slugging, his expected slugging is, like, slightly better than last year. But the hard hit rate going down yet again, the ground ball rate still being bad. I just, it, weighted on base isn't good. His weight on base is 299 right now, which isn't good. And it's not like his expected is all that much higher at 325. He just looks rough right now. Uh, he looks really, really rough. And I'm really nervous about him. And I don't even know if he has an extra base hit yet. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think he does. Let me actually check that really quickly. What do we got? 2024. He has one double. I didn't even notice when he got the double, frankly. So that that's on me. My apologies for that. It was probably in like a Friday game or I just I probably just forgot. He has one extra base hit this year, so con- congrats. Whatever. Still no home runs though. Um It's them. Hassan Kim is not as frustrating because in fairness, I think that the big thing with him is that his defense, even when his bat isn't performing all that great, is going to be a plus, right? But a regression is kind of something that we expected, right? At least to a degree. Now, it's very early, and his statistics suggest that he's getting a little bit unlucky. He's hitting the ball a little bit harder than he did last year, which is really, 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 like, that's a good sign. Um, his average exit velocity is about the same as it was last year, just up by a tiny bit. But his hard hit rate is up a little bit. So give it some time um, with Kim. But even still, the big thing with him is he's just a really solid utility player that might hit maybe, you know, 18 to 20 home runs or something like that, and then provide immaculate defense at shortstop, except for this weekend, of course. Um, so he's, I'm not freaking out about him. If 
if Kim reverts to the offensive player that he was that second year, there are worse things to happen. He's not the one I'm worried about. It's Manny Machado. Manny Machado has been terrible. Um, it's frustrating. And it's like, of course, like, again, the double play stuff, right? Like, the double plays on Sunday that they hit into, what happens, right? They had multiple times when they're hitting into double plays. I'm sorry to bring up um, Sunday's game again, but I just got to bring it up. Just how often, like, you get Hassan Kim to get a single to get an RBI. Finally, he shows up. And then Profar hits into a double play. Then you get Kyle Higashioka hitting into a double play after Profar and Jackson Merrill get on base. And then, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, there was another um, point throughout the game that I don't want to spend too much time on that game. But I just, like, they're so frustrating. So frustrating. And then just to, to, to close things out, Friday's game, another good start from Dylan Cease, except a much better one. He goes a lot deeper into this game. Six innings, two earned runs on only... Uh, four hits, two walks, seven Ks. He was really solid. He's been really solid. The whip is low. That's his thing, right? Like, he's not going to give up too many hits, but may give up a lot of free passes. And a little bit of pitching ninja vibes for him. But, of course, Enel De Los Santos, who doesn't deserve blame. Uh, let me be very clear. Enel De Los Santos doesn't deserve any blame. He hadn't given up a run all season. And what is it that the Padres have shown, especially, again, 2023 vibes? Every time a reliever was doing well for them last year, that one would be the one that would blow up when they needed them not to blow up because the offense that has all these superstars can only conjure up three runs. So you just beg. It's like you're asking the bullpen to blow games. You know, it's like you're tempting the fates in that favor. So what happens in this one, um, you know, unfortunately hits or I'm sorry. Wani Peralta comes in, um, gets a fly out um, from Michael Conforto. And then the Santos comes in hits Matt Chapman, and then Tyro Estrada hits an absolute bomb. I will say, close play at the plate that they deserve credit for. Shouts to the relay throws and everything. That was impressive, but it's just so frustrating. And to me, it's like, remember, here's the inning right before that. You get Jay Cronin with gets a single. He gets to um, second base on a pass ball. Machado walks. What happens? Kim strikes out. Profar strikes out. That's just what they do. It's just what this Padres team does. Every time you need anything from them, anything from them, in the clutch, they just don't come up. doesn't matter who it is. Uh, in the top of the third inning, right when they're getting, gaining some momentum, Merrill gets a single, and Xander Borgerts gets lucky, reaching on a fielder's choice. I think it was an error, I'm pretty sure. Tatis gets a single. We got the momentum, baby. We got the momentum. Guess what happens? Jake Cronenworth double play. A player who has been playing well this year, by the way. Oh, oh, that's not it either. Jake Cronenworth gets a single in the first inning, right? And it's like, Okay, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's just so funny that he's the one that drives in an RBI to start, then hits into a double play later. Um, Bogarts hits a double. That's what it was. Okay, it was on Friday's game. My apologies, guys. Bogart starts it off with a double. That's probably why I missed it, because it was top of the first inning. Um, Bogarts hits the double. Jay Corinth gets a single. And then what happens? Machado double play. Like, it's just incredible that they keep doing this. It's incredible. I hate them um, a lot. I'm really worried about the trio. Um, out of all of them, the one that I'm worried the most about is Bogarts because the hard hit stuff is bad. Um, Machado's the most frustrating for me because unlike Bogarts, who you can now, and hindsight's 2020, no, don't get me wrong, but at least Bogarts, you could be like, hey, his weighted on base was bad that last year. He had a wrist injury, which I didn't know about full disclosure when the signing first happened, but you have that, um, you know, all these other players. And then Machado, it's like literally you're coming off an MPP season. There is nothing with your hard hit data. Nothing. It's not like the velocity you're waiting on, but, and then you decide to turn into a dandelion. You decide to turn into a decayed corpse of a skeleton that has been rotting for 20,000 years. That's what Manny Machado has done ever since he got paid. Seriously. It's just true. It's just what's happened, and it's frustrating. But what's even more frustrating, folks, is that we're not done with this podcast of misery. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry that I'm in a bad mood, but guess what? You guys are going to put me in a good mood. We're going to talk about some of your questions and comments in just a second. Before we do that, I want to talk to you a little bit about game time. We love game time over here because your boy is actually going to a Yankees game at some point against the Padres. So go look up when that is in your schedule. And I'm also going to a Yankee game by the time you're watching. It's just for fun. Why not? Um, Because the Padres have a night game. Um, But you know how I got that ticket? I use Game Time, folks. That's right. And let me tell you, there's all sorts of great deals on Game Time. Last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. Look, man, it can be frustrating to buy tickets sometimes. And it's great that Game Time is here. They even have lowest, um, sorry, 
event cancellation protection, job loss protection, etc. You can view the seats from everywhere in the venue. And you can also just, it's deals up to the moment. So say you don't know if you're going to be free. Game time has got you covered with like just, you know, last minute stuff to help you get covered. Save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports. And here's the kicker. Comedy, concerts, theater, they cover you in everything, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just sports, not just baseball. It's really cool. I love that. All in pricing. They, they, they got you covered with game time. What can I say? Um, it's just... It's just fantastic. So take the guesswork, you know? Don't just be like, oh, I hope I'm free. You know what I mean? I hope I'm free in two weeks. I really want to go. Take that out. Eliminate that possibility, ladies and gentlemen, by checking out Game Time. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the Game Time app with the code First Pitch. Terms apply. That's spelled First Pitch. First Pitch. F I R S T P I T C H for $20 off from March 25th to april 14th so just seven more days guys go check that out download the game time app today last minute tickets lowest prices guaranteed with game time all right you sly dogs you it's mailbag time ladies and gentlemen and again it's just (sighs) i want to say one more thing i've been getting a little bit of flack for my my guy my Australian homie, you know who you are, for Michael Conforto. <laughs> I've been getting flack because he's been killing us so far this year. He's looked good. I just want to say that two things. That I just think it's important to remember that everything that looks bad, if a player is performing bad, does not mean you go all into that. And if a player is performing well on the surface level, you don't go all into that. What I mean by this is, I got a lot of flack for saying I liked Michael Conforto as a possible trade target. If you were to move Hassan Kim, I preferred Lamont Wade because he has outfield and first base. So that's who I preferred. But that's why I wanted him in free agency a few years ago. I think that he's a really good player. We'll see if he keeps it up. And more importantly, I got a lot of flack for Hassan Kim, um, who I thought they should trade. I just want to throw it out there that he hasn't been as good this year. And I just want to throw it out there that like these things mold and change over time. It's very easy to be like, well, Kim was a four-win player. The end. Don't trade him. Hey, look how Bogarts looks right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, these things, they there's ebbs and flows to all these things. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying, don't be mean to me, guys. It made me sad. No, I'm kidding. It didn't make me sad. But, in all seriousness, I'm not saying I would trade Kim, but he might get traded if they keep playing like this. Let me tell you. That's that's absolutely in play. Um, let's do it, folks. Let's talk about one thing. Let's talk about the mailbag questions. That's right. Remember, everybody, you can send it to me at Javapeno in the YouTube comments, whatever. And sometimes even if you don't intend for them to be mailbag questions, I will read them out loud because I like exposing people. I like to keep everybody on their toes, folks. Like this guy, Ian0903. I'll be honest, I'm a Padres fan, but when I heard Javier say that he thinks the Padres will sweep the Giants, I thought this is exactly the problem of us Padres as fans. We are delusional. Um, first of all, I'm sorry that I didn't just go onto a podcast and say, yeah, they'll split the series, like the most casual, obvious thing to say. Um, and also, it's not like I'm talking about delusional. Delusional would be me coming in and saying, I think the Padres are winning the NL West. That would be a lot more delusional. I gave my reasons, and I said I thought the Giants would be a second-half team, and I thought that they would jump on them quick. A lot of people have been critical, so what will fuel the fire more than an almost sweep? That didn't happen. They split the series, but relax, dude. Um, this is not a good reflection of how delusional Padres fans are. I actually don't find Padres fans to be all that delusional about a lot of things, other than maybe just the whole... Hey, that guy's good. Go get him right now. Hey, that guy's bad. Trade him away. Hey, like you can't just keep getting players and extending everybody forever. You know what I mean? Then you're just locked in. And this is one of the most inconsistent core groups in all of baseball. This Padres team with, you know, the Machado, Bogarts, Tatis, Soto, Corona. So inconsistent as we've seen that like going all in on a team that hasn't proven that they can make the third wild card consistently isn't what I would do. But anyway, going on a little bit of a rant. (sighs) I'm sorry, guys. I'm just annoyed. Uh, Next one. From LFGSD Padres, says the host with the most, bruh, Machado, it's so funny saying bruh like in real life, you know what I mean? Bruh. Uh, Machado always swings for the fences. He doesn't know what a base hit is. Xander has been doing great so far this year. I'm surprised by Crony. He has also been doing great so far this year. Of course, the campy hive is buzzing with his batting average. Yeah, Xander has had two bad throws. I thought moving to second was supposed to make it easier on him. So there's a lot of things here. Machado 
I talked about this last year. It wasn't just only solo shots that he had more than with men on base. Machado was just like abject horror when it mattered last year. He was just awful. And one of the things about him is that he deserved a little bit of a break because he had that big surgery, right? And it was saying, okay, maybe he was hurt. Maybe he was just a little bit off. But even still so far, just in 2024, in terms of the high leverage situations, um, he actually apparently has been good. That's what's funny. But in like medium leverage, he's been bad. He's got a 13 WRC plus. So don't get me wrong. But again, these numbers, they're not good for right now, right? It's mostly been a team thing. You can't, I can't single out one player who's been a problem with runners on base and high leverage situations. Cause if Machado has one hit in a high leverage situation, his thing will go through the roof. That's just how it is right now. But in terms of last year, he was terrible. Um, like he, he was just really bad last year. It was really frustrating. And like I said, hit as many home runs till the cows went home. 123 WRC plus low, 117 medium, 58 in high leverage situations. And that was basically the case for the entire team. Um, so totally agree with you on that. Um, in terms of the idea that like Machado just just not good with the base sets, he's not only a swing for the fences guy. Don't get me wrong, um, he's just not like he's a guy that can get get on base. His strikeout to walk ratio is among some of the best among all qualified hitters since like 2018, I believe. Um, so it's you know give him a second. Although I will say it's not like he's shown us any sign that he's heating up, and it's especially frustrating because you're coming off the injury, you had the surgery, you're allegedly healthy, and you're not even playing third. So I imagine that makes it more frustrating that like your only job is to hit right now, and you're about as easy and out to get as like Javier Baez of the Detroit Tigers right now. So that's not great. Um, Cronenworth has been a splendid surprise as well. I was a little bit worried about him, and one of the reasons I wanted to trade Hassan Kim was because. I thought you might be able to get more value with him in the infield with his defense. But so far, he's smoking the ball. I'm telling you guys, the role players are stepping up. It's just the team as a whole needs to be on the same page. They need to fire on all cylinders instead of just individual, all right, here's one hero every game, and then everyone else does nothing. That's kind of been the vibe here. And then um, moving him to second, yeah, he's been whatever so far. Not negative defensively, not terrible, but he's been whatever. And yes, maybe the position change is throwing him off a little bit. Totally possible, but it's not like last year showed that he was necessarily like, you know, a beast and that shortstop moving him off then just ruined him. Um, next one, Rama Murdy, old friend, Rama Murdy at Rama Murdy 9938 over on YouTube said, since Waka is no longer with the team, should Pac-Man still be around? Referring to, of course, for people who watch the show on YouTube, my little Pac-Man guy. Um, bullpen is a work in progress, but we have to trust Niebla. Yeah, the bullpen to me... I'm not super, like, worried about it. I, I I think Matsui looks great. I think De Los Santos until the blow-up, which, again, tough situation to be in. The team was begging the Giants to come back all game long. In fact, that game and then Sunday's game, I literally texted, shout out Just Baseball, great website. Um, I literally texted, like, we, we do a joke where whenever we think our team is going to win, we always say live bet the other team. And we mean it, though. In a lot of ways, even though we're just trying to be funny, we don't want it to happen, of course. Um, but I had texted being like live at the Giants, and I've said that in the seventh inning, I believe. Uh, so maybe you guys can blame me. But with this game, um, you know, De Los Santos does get killed, but hey, um, it happens. And I think that with the bullpen overall, I'm confident too, Ron Murdy. I, I really am. I think that it's going to be better. I think that it's a retooled bullpen, it'll have its, its shortcomings. And also, Brito is inflating the stats a little bit. Don't get me wrong. And also the really bad Cosgrove outing that single-handedly killed them when he gave up six, like Cosgrove's not that bad. Right. So that was just a huge blow up plus Brito. Everything else is not too bad though. Juani Peralta, De, De Los Santos, Yuki Matsui. Like it looks good. Like I really think the bullpen is going to be okay. I don't think I'm freaking out about that in terms of Pac-Man. That's a good question. If you guys want to leave a comment, if I should get rid of Pac-Man or not, the reason I've kept him is because he's yellow and that's the Padres team color. That's the only reason. And just because, it, I don't know, I feel like it shares my personality. Big sports lunatic, and then I also a big gamer, you know, pop culture uh, geek. So, you know, but let me know. And maybe maybe what we could do is I switch it out. I'll bring in a new figure every day. You guys want that? Leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Um, thank you, though, of course, Ron Murdy, always for your comments. What else we got here? What else we got here, folks? Oh, we got one more. Oh, that's right. This is about Michael King. I love this insight from this YouTube commenter, at Tony Sue 8860 Regarding Michael King, in my opinion, his eyeball performance has been better than the stats. I can't be sure because, like last year, Spectrum isn't spending any more on broadcasting its Padres games than necessary. And like most of last year, you have to watch Padres games on a TV and not streaming to your computing device. In other words, you can't get Channel 305 using Spectrum streaming service. I will say, 
I usually don't watch watch it on my computer. I usually put it on my 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 PS5. You know what I mean? Uh, I usually put it on the streaming app on Amazon. Actually, is where I got my ticket through. So that's I put on streaming video on my laptop or my, not my laptop, my PlayStation. Um, that's hooked up to the TV. But based on highlights, it looks like Michael King is pitching what Niebla teaches, converting velocity into movement. So I'm not too concerned about the slightly lower velocity, but suggest maybe going back to velocity over movement from time to time as a different look. I think that's a great point, which is one of the things I've said, which is like it was worrisome because, look, I got to get impressions from something that happens um, in these first few starts. And my impression was oh, velocity is down. That's usually not a good thing. Um, and since it's his second straight start, that velocity has been down. I am a little bit worried about it, but it is true. He has looked a little bit sharper. Like I said, seven swings and misses on his changeup. Like he was putting batters away. Like he had a, he, he, mm, like I'm talking like pitching ninja. Like you'll see those on the highlight reel. In terms of his like vertical break, vertical break and stuff like that on some of his, his pitches, like his changeup, it has improved a little bit, right? Like he's, he looks a little bit better. He looks a little bit better on those pitches. It's forcing fastball by an inch, but the changeup by three inches, like the movement is solid. So if that's what he's aiming for, and it's not like the spin rate is too down, then yeah, maybe that is, maybe that's what they're aiming for. I'm not freaking out about Michael King, but again, it was just week one, and my thing was seven walks and a velocity down. That makes me a little bit nervous. But even still, what's so great is that Michael King is the four in this rotation, right? So even if he's not necessarily going to be that 2-6 ERA, 30% strikeout rate that he'd been with the Yankees. That's still, like, if he is what he is now, that's still pretty good. The same way, like, what Waldron delivered for the team is very good. Like, guys, no team outside, like, a couple and some of the best teams ever have, like, five, you know, low twos ERA starters. Like, that's just not what's going to happen. So I like what I've seen from him, but that's a great point and analysis. And I should have mentioned that when I was talking about King, that, like, Niebla has done that before, so... You know, with the movement, as long as he's doing that, because the movement looks sharp, man, it did. He looked good. He really, really did. And only one walk, got the four strikeouts. Really excited to see him in his next start. But Padres starting pitching hasn't been a problem. I know the bullpen got blown up. You know, that that, that happens sometimes. But for me, it's been the stars not showing up and finding new ways to lose. That's kind of been explaining um, the Padres struggles this year. And that seems to be their issue like every year. So we will see. We will see, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, that's about it. That's about it for today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, of the Lockdown Pirates Podcast. <sighs> As always, be sure to check out myself on Twitter, at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at LO underscore Padres. Reach out wherever on YouTube. Send me your questions. Let me know about Pac-Man. I'm going to keep asking about that, by the way, because I don't know. I, he's yellow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he's a yellow guy, so I thought that it might fit. Or if you guys just want to have that be, like, a new gimmick, I've been talking about how I need a new bit every year. Last year, Can't Be Hive, year before the Joker hat, stuff like that. Maybe my new bit is I replace, not Tatis, oh my god, Pac-Man's leg just fell off. Oh dear, oh dear, that's not good. Um, <laughs> Down goes Pac-Man. Um, maybe that'll be my new bit, is just replacing Pac-Man and having a new toy guy. Because believe me, I'm a dork and I have many. But of course, guys, go check out um, JustBaseball.com as well, where I'll be writing about the Padres probably this week. Don't know what exactly yet, but look forward to that. And in terms of the future of this podcast, maybe do a crossover with the Cubs host. I don't know if I'll have a chance with Matt Cousy. I don't know if I'm going to have a chance to do that. But um, we will be facing off against the Cubs. And then after that, we probably will have a crossover with the next team that the Padres are supposed to be facing, which is, who do you guys think it is? Who do you think it is? It's the Dodgers. So I'm going to try. I'm going to reach out to the Snide Dog, see what happens. But we'll see. We'll see. And we'll see how they play uh, in this upcoming series against the Cubs, who just select the Dodgers. So hopefully they, you know, get on the action. You know what I mean? Hopefully they can give it right back to the Cubs. So we'll see how that all pans out, guys. But until next time, stay safe. And of course, despite my tone for this podcast, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies. Take care.